This is interesting because this does. Ah, it is my slide. Um, thank you, Saki, for that international perspective. I thought it was really brilliant. And um, now we're having a look at really our national perspective on emergency planning and particularly working with the emergency services. Um, and the reason that we're looking for the, uh, with the emergency services is particularly the fire brigade is there the first on the scene. And um, back in, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm going back to that one. Uh, there was a whole list of words on that slide, um, which were the fact that the fire and rescue services have a duty under the uh, Fire and Rescue Services Act to fight fires to start with, and then to do salvage um, as, a, as a result of their fire, firefighting activities. So they're really well placed to tackle um, salvage uh, matters. In 2008, um, the communities and local government were writing guidance to fire and rescue services on um, the protection of heritage buildings and structures. And in that guidance, they were saying that um, the fire and rescue services should be prepared to work with um, civilian salvage teams. And part of the guidance includes command and control functions, cordons, access to buildings, likely firefighting recovering strategies. So in terms of emergency planning, we're talking very similar to yours, uh, uh, about anticipation, what's likely to happen, uh, how to prevent it happening to start with, to protect against it happening, and then re response and recovery. And in terms of emergency planning, the very first thing to do is to write the plan. Then to do a paper exercise to see whether the plan is going to work. Adjust the plan if necessary. Then do a full-scale exercise, preferably with the emergency services, and then again adjust the plan. And it's in writing one of these plans that um, we had an issue at one of the English Heritage sites, which was Broadsworth Hall, which is the... Um, the yellow upside down T next to the green there. Um, I had a fire hydrant quite close to it, but when you open the fire hydrant cup, it just water just dribbled out. It just wasn't enough pressure in, the, in there to fight a fire. And the next nearest hydrant um, <coughs> is down where it, to the top of where it says entrance. There's a 150 mil mm. hydrant there. And it's 40 hose lengths away from Rosworth Hill, uh, House, and it's up a steep hill. We needed 10 fire engines to maintain the pressure from that hydrant up to the house. And because it's a single lane track up to the house, fire engines wouldn't be able to get past the ones that there were there to deliver water. So as a result of that, in the middle of the car park, we dug um, an underground tank. Um, and deciding how big that tank was going to be, we decided that if you had six hoses playing on a fire, we'd need them going for an hour. So we looked at the capacity of the hose, how much water it was going to take, and we decided on a 25,000 litre tank, which was put in. And then we thought we need to test this plan. And so we invited the fire brigade to do an exercise there, um, where the fire was developing on the roof. We used smoke generators to provide artificial smoke, and this was just to test the water supply. Now, unfortunately, in the car park, there was um, a tank next to the water tank that was used for sewage. And the fire brigade um, opened the wrong lid <laughs> and started pumping sewage. So that was the first lesson. We need to, we need to label the tanks. <laughs> the other issue was that they, um, they parked the fire engines on the uh, approach roads. When the turntable ladder came up, they couldn't get past the fire engine. So then we adjusted the plan, we produced this which is now on the fire engines on that mobile data terminal and it shows where to shoot, put the booster pumps and where the tanks are and where the fire engines should go. And in terms of documentations, um, this is a, a salvage plan for something called Washington Hall in Lancashire. Um, and we started doing some training because one of the issues was that the fire brigade didn't have training in heritage buildings with salvage. 
and we didn't have training in working with the fire brigades. So we created these salvage plans that were easy for the fire brigade to see. Um, the top left of the plan shows which room is involved. The one down below is um, where in the room the particular object is. And on the reverse side, what the object is, um, we don't we simplify what it's called to make it easier to identify the size, how many people you need to lift them, and what to do when you remove. And this um, post steam by Van Gogh is um, features in a lot of our exercise since then. Now the fire brigade, they what we wouldn't want to do is for the fire engine to turn up and the officer in charge to jump off and say, right, I need to do a risk assessment. It's a legal obligation they would do a written uh, risk assessment for all health and safety activities. So they've rewritten or have standardised writing. So, oh. so what they will do is they will take no risk for non-savable life or non-savable property. They will take a little calculated risk for savable life or savable uh, property and they will take a lot of calculated risk just for savable life. Um, and they, what they will do is they will either fight the fire from outside or they'll fight it from inside. If it's from outside, then they will tell control um, that they are in defensive mode. In other words, they're not taking any risk of going inside the building. If they're going into the building, then it's offensive. And simply by telling control, that's the mode of firefighting, the, the, the um, control can then do a written risk assessment. But they need to describe the property, so they divide the property into sectors. Sector 1 is always at the front of the building, sector 2 to the uh, left, you go around clockwise, sector 3 at the back, uh, sector 4 to the right. The fire brigade have an inner cordon, and the fire brigade police the inner cordon. And there's an outer cordon that the police um, uh, make sure that nobody goes through. So when the message goes back to control, they can say we're in offensive mode in sector one, we're defensive in sector two. And then control will know that there's people going into the front of the building, but they're not going into the back. Here's an example in Newcastle of the uh, fire gate sector, so they're in control of that and a bit further out. The um, police are stopping traffic. There's also functional sectors, so in addition to geographical sectors, they can be marshalling of fire engines, water supplies, firefighting, and um, breathing apparatus sectors. There's a pre prescribed <coughs> evacuation si signal, which is the repeated blasts on the Acme Thunderer. The incident commander is always in charge, you cannot do anything without his say so or her say so. And there are sector commanders, and they are in charge by ge either geographical or operational sectors. In addition to that, stop people going into the building. Breathing apparatus guys have to um, check in with a breathing apparatus control operator who um, shows <coughs> what pressures there are on the breathing apparatus sets. They always go in teams of two or three, and the one with the lowest pre pressure has to go, come back um, out all together as a team, they go on the lowest pressure. There's an instant command system decision making model, and that's on arrival <coughs> and the planning and um, implementing. So on arrival, the fire service want information. <coughs> they want to know where the fire is, if anybody's trapped, if there's anything that needs uh, recovery. They need resource information. Have you got salvage teams? Have I got another fire engine coming? Have I got another ten fire engines coming? How long will it take them to arrive? And also hazard information. So are there any flammable gases or fuels or anything like that? And then the most important thing about this decision-making model is the thinking time. Because when the fire brigade first arrived, they might only have one fire engine. They can't do everything with one fire engine. There'll be an officer in charge. There'll be a couple of firefighters and there'll be a driver. So they need to prioritise their objectives with what they've got at the time, create a tactical plan, and then they need to implement the tactical plan by passing it on to the crews by communication. The crews implement the tactical plan, 
and the officer in charge um, controls it. And all the while, there's an evaluation. Another fire engine will come on, or the fire will have spread, or the fire might be going out. So there's this continual circle of evaluation. The fire brigade had that um, management where you have the incident uh, commander at the top, you have sector commanders below. And the reason for that is to limit the span of control. So in terms of emergency salvage, we need to match that management system. So we have an incident coordinator who looks after salvage teams and recovery teams. The, um, the several salvage teams coordinator have salvage team leaders below them and then the salvage teams themselves. So when you get both um, uh, teams together, you have the fire service <coughs> commander talking to the incident coordinator, you have the sector commander salvage talking to the salvage team coordinator, and then you have the crew commanders talking to the salvage team leaders. So that there's a, a, a seamless uh, management system for managing the incident. And uh, we need to plan and train to avoid chaos. So we need emergency plans, route plans, priority items, site plans, roles of the salvage teams and the salvage team members. Um, Historic England have been running this emergency planning practical salvage talk, uh, course now since 2001, the first one we did. We went into fire service uh, properties in 2009 in Washington, uh, and then we since moved to the um, the West Midlands. It's a three-day uh, practical salvage course. There's lots of learning goes on it, but not only from the delegates, but from the um, people that are teaching the course. We learn about things. Um, and what we use is um, a firehouse. We can set fires into these places. We dress them as a museum or a country house. Uh, we have real artifacts, and there's posty again. Um, we teach the delegates how to move through smoke. They actually wear breathing apparatus to go through smoke-filled rooms. Uh, and here they're going, and this is a heart-stopping moment for those that have been of course. There are real flames there, and they uh, go around the place just to see what the fire service, what they're faced with when they go into uh, this sort of scenario. It's not designed for them to become breathing apparatus wearers and to do salvage with Apparatus is just to give them an idea. We do things like managing water or not managing water, as the case may be, and this is one of the learning points. We find we cannot lift the weight of water, and therefore we found a way of using ladders to create troughs, um, which enable us to do it much, uh, much more efficiently. There's uh, classroom sessions where we um, learn about first aid treatment of objects, um, there's a manual handling section so that we don't uh, damage our delegates. There's a packing session where we learn how to pack the objects. And there's a full-scale exercise at the end of the um, uh, session where the, um, the teams come together and actually practice with Fire Brigade. And this lady here, the incident coordinator from the civilian side, is just passing over salvage sheets to the fire brigade so they can go in and rescue some objects. Other learning things, we used to have a book shoot. This was up in um, <coughs> Northumberland uh, recent, recent, sorry, originally, and then we transferred it down to Washington Hall. We've had some really precarious problems with the book shoot. And if it's slightly windy, the book shoot goes to one side and the books fall off. Um, and I think we had a really near miss with uh, one of our regional directors. So we thought it might be better if we um, lowered the books down the same shoot with um, ropes and bags. And then we thought, well, if we've got a rope and a bag, why do we need the shoot? So we changed our opinions and we started using ropes and uh, taking bags full of books down. But these book shoots can work. At Litchfield Cathedral, they've got one um, from the first floor. Um, it's in their tower. They've got the library upstairs. And this book shoot is um, a tube. So you just unroll the tube, chuck it out the window, and the wooden frame braces it. So you can just chuck all the books down the tube into a waiting, um, in, into a, a waiting trolley. We've also some, done some uh, experimentation with the Cerebral Palaces. 
at the moment, um, they have, or at the time of this picture, they had some ladders that they used for removing paintings from walls. And this poor chap has to climb up the ladder with a rope, put it through the ladder, tie it round the um, painting, and then once it's tied round the painting, then the guys at the bottom lower it. And this is dangerous for this, obviously, because that rope is going up between his legs. Um, he's having to come down the ladder without getting uh, damaged himself. Um, but it is um, it's low tech. Um, the manner of fastening the lines of the paintings might cause damage and it could slip. So we worked on other solutions. And one of the solutions was to have um, uh, a winch on the back of the ladder so that the rope goes up the back. Um, there's me just testing my knots. I was just trying it out. I didn't realise I was going to lift this painting up so high. So, um, yeah, we, we originally tried with a piece of wood on the top that was covered in uh, felt. But it, we felt it was a danger because that piece of wood covered in felt could damage the picture if it came down too low. So then we tried experimenting on the course to see whether we could do away with it. Um, the, the piece of wood is just above the painting there, so we went back um, to the salvage course and we tried very, very hard to try and shape the picture out of the two um, harnesses and we found we didn't need that piece of wood and, uh, and that was a way forward. And then that developed a bit further in that you could actually lower paintings out of a window by using the same method. Um, this was in a, a particular country house that had a window. It had a picture that was too big for the doors, so it couldn't be removed. The only way you could get it out was to take the windows down and then put the painting out through the window um, and lower it to the ground, with people on the outside with guidelines to keep it away from the, uh, the building. And of course, we, this is an earthquake in Italy, and we can be a bit careless with painting. This is not the way to remove the painting because as soon as you put it on its corner then it's got forces on the canvas and it could uh, damage it quite severely. So on the course we learn the game with posting, how to handle uh, paintings properly to make sure that they're not uh, tilted on their sides. Um, and we do full scale exercises at Kenwood House um, <coughs> in London and um, we had uh, I'm sorry, the, the, um, we'll go on to the, this. So we had full-scale exercise in, in, in Kenwood. To, uh, we did the um, paper exercise first. Fire brigades were um, invited in to um, go up the stairs. They made me a real um, pig's ear of running out this hose. <laughs> and um, we've been very careful to protect all the objects, but the guy on the left-hand side with that breathing apparatus cil um, cylinder is right next to a Landseer uh, painting. So we've actually had to have somebody standing just out of shot to stop them getting too close. Live casualties are always very useful because it adds a bit of added, added dimension to an exercise. And uh, I think she's double jointed because her right leg is actually folded under her uh, body itself. So um, quite nasty. And here comes the um, postie again. Um, fire gates moving artifacts. And we do it in all weathers. And in fact, manual handling is the, probably the worst health and safety risk when you're doing salvage. But actually, here it came slips and trips. And um, where there was lots of room when it's not snowing, when it is snowing, actually everything gets reduced down and you've got problems with um, pedestrians and vehicle movement. Um, and just a nod towards Notre Dame, we, we had that terrible fire uh, there. This is Notre Dame before the fire and during. Um, fires in cathedrals are really quite rare, but the highest fire loading is up in the roof. This is, um, this is Notre Dame before the fire. I don't know what that guy's doing there, maybe a little cigarette. Um, but, um, <laughs> What was interesting about it was that there were some collapse, but this fire here is actually the burning roof timbers gone down through to the floor. So nothing in the in the base of the church was actually burning at the time except the roof timbers. Um, and it was also interesting that this 
Um, when the steeple came down, the fire was already burning in the east, and the wind was blowing east-west. So I suspect it probably started in the east. Um, and there you can see the fire burning um, above, and part of the collapse was caused by the steeple, but the other bit of collapse was caused by water. And it's something that it would be really difficult for an officer in charge, with the whole world watching, to say, let's stop squirting water because it's overloading the, um, the fan vaulting and will cause it to collapse. When Donald Trump said, you know, dumps some yeah. fan loads of water on it. So actually, with the emergency planning for our cathedrals, this is uh, Peterborough Cathedral, we need to look at the fan vaulting and look at the, how much water they could um, contain before they collapse and think about solutions such as uh, weak panels that can drop out and, um, and relieve the pressure or relieve the weight on it. So scuppers on, on the outside would be ideal because then the water goes external from the building. Um, but we panels on the inside of the car find external um, scuppers. And also to look at the construction of the roof and decide if there's going to be a fire, how is it going to progress, and how are the firefighters going to tackle it. And that's it. And whatever you do, don't email me at that address. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I would um, recommend the uh, English Heritage standout here. Uh, where they have lots of details on flooding and fires and other risks to heritage buildings. Thank you.